Bonjour. Hello and welcome to ESRF in Grenoble. ESRF is the most powerful synchrotron light source in Europe. In 1988, several European countries decided to work together to build and operate the synchrotron. This colossal microscope opened in 1994. Every year it welcomes thousands of researchers from all over the world. Growing numbers of chemists, doctors, archaeologists, biologists, physicists, geologists and other scientists are turning to synchrotron light to get an up-close and personal look at matter. To see the world around us, the most common tool is, of course, the human eye. As long as there is light, we can see things, even relatively small ones, for example, the eye of an insect or the tip of a needle. But in order to look at smaller objects, we need a magnifying glass, or even better, a microscope. A powerful microscope allows us to look at tiny objects like biological cells. When objects get smaller, ten thousand times smaller, natural light is not enough. To explore the world of atoms, we need a different kind of light, called X-rays. The beams of X-ray light produced here at ESRF are particularly bright. They're very narrow and intense, much like laser beams. This synchrotron light allows us to see details down to the nanometer, that's one billionth of a meter. In other words, synchrotron light gives us images of what is ordinarily invisible. So now you can see why so many researchers come to ESRF. A nanometer is the size of an atom. It is much, much smaller than a meter, of course, but how much smaller exactly? Well, imagine the size of a marble next to the size of our planet Earth. Or take a single human hair, which is 100,000 nanometers thick. In order to produce this very bright light, it is necessary to accelerate electrons, which, once in the storage ring, circulate for several hours at the speed of light. The electron beam is extremely thin, about one-tenth of a millimeter. It is entirely guided by magnets. The bending magnets force the bunches of electrons to change direction. And it's at this moment that a flash of synchrotron light is produced. The beams of light will then go into the beam lines which are built around the storage ring. There are about 40 beam lines for use by scientists. We're now in the experimental hall. This is where the beam lines are found. A full lap around the hall is nearly one kilometer long, which explains why the people who work here travel around on bicycles. On average, researchers spend three days at ESRF. Before they come here, they spend a long time preparing for their experiments, and after they leave, they spend months analyzing the data. As you can imagine, they're very focused on their work and don't have a minute to spare. Here, for example, is a team of geophysicists at work. Nicolas, bonjour. Bonjour. What type of work do you do here? Here we study the physical properties of materials submitted to extreme conditions of pressure and temperature, as in the lower mantle of the Earth. We'd like to go as far as the conditions in its center. In order to reproduce the conditions of pressure and temperature deep inside the Earth, we can use a type of press with two diamonds facing each other. We simply place a sample between these two diamonds. To heat the sample up to very high temperatures, we focus a laser beam onto it. It is thus possible to reach temperatures as high as 5,000 degrees and pressures of 2 million atmospheres, which correspond to the beginning of the Earth's core. About 6,000 researchers a year come to ESRF to carry out their experiments. Projects are selected by review committees on the criterion of scientific excellence. Most of the time, ESRF is the only place where their research projects can be performed. A very special feature of synchrotrons is the extraordinary variety of scientific fields covered and their multidisciplinarity, allowing plenty of exchanges. Moreover, at ESRF, researchers from different countries work together and make common efforts to pursue even more ambitious projects. Even if you can hear many different languages, the official language is English, and everyone seems to be comfortable communicating with each other.
Chacune de lumière fonctionne 24 heures. Each beamline runs 24 hours a day, virtually uninterrupted. There are so many experiments to be done, there just isn't enough time for everyone. The light produced here is mostly made up of X-rays, just like the ones you find in hospitals. But these X-rays are a thousand billion times brighter. They may be invisible to the naked eye, but like a hospital X-ray machine, they're also dangerous to our health. So all of the cabins are insulated with lead, even the windows. No one's allowed to enter during an experiment. But don't worry, it is perfectly safe where we are. When the synchrotron radiation enters the beamline, it must first go through the optics cabin. The optics cabin contains instruments that the researchers use to give the light the specific properties they need for their experiments. The object of the monochromator, for example, is to select a specific color in the beam. This is where the sample is exposed to synchrotron light. In most cases, the sample is so tiny we can hardly see it. The X-rays light up the interior of the sample, thus revealing its composition and structure. Hi, Mikhail. What are you studying on this beam line? So on this beam line, we are trying to make films of uh, molecules in action. So we try to film how molecules uh, change composition and shape during uh, chemical reactions that are introduced by a short flash of laser light. What you see here is uh, a crystal of the, the protein myoglobin. This molecule is actually present in our blood and it transports oxygen as, as we breathe. We, we have found that uh, the CO molecule and the O2 molecule move in and out through a network of very small cavities in the protein. And these cavities are really essential for life. If these cavities were not there, life in mammals could not happen on Earth. And this has only been possible because the synchrotron permits making films with truly atomic resolution and very, very fast time resolution. We study myoglobin, first of all, because it's uh, scientifically very interesting. However, there are also, in the future, potential medical and biomedical applications. And this could, for example, have influence on treating respiration diseases and uh, could even imagine to be able to enhance the way sportsmen uh, take up oxygen when they run, for example.